Hey everybody, Ryan here. Alright, I'm going to go over the games for today. February 23rd, 2021. Like usual, if you have not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button. And hit that notification bell so that you can be notified when I drop a new video. Alright, on to the games for today. First game was between Buffalo and the New Jersey Devils. Buffalo won this game 4-1. New Jersey can go from beating Boston no problem to losing to Buffalo no problem. That's how it is, I guess. So, there you have it. Second period, Victor Olofsson scored his 7th of the year on the power play from Rasmus Dahlin and Sam Reinhardt to open the score. Then, that's all scoring in the first two periods. Third period, you have 516 into third. Rasmus Asplund scores his first of the year from Sam Reinhardt and Jack Eichel, making a 2 0 Buffalo. 650 into third. Dylan Cousins, third from Taylor Hall and Eric Stahl. Good to see Dylan Cousins back. I know he took a little while from the COVID issue that the team had, so I know he was still feeling under the weather. But he is back, so that's good to see. Then at 19.32 of the third, New Jersey scores their first of the game, killing the shutout with 28 seconds left in the game. Nikita Gusev second from P.K. Subban and Pavel Zaka. Then with one second le left in the game, Cody Eakin scores his first as a Buffalo Sabre from Kyle Pozo, making a 4-1 the final score. Uh, New Jersey outshot Buffalo 42-37. Uh, they were even 50% each on the faceoff. Uh, Buffalo was 1 for 2 on the power play, New Jersey 0 for 2. Four penalty minutes each. Hits were 20-18 in favor of New Jersey. Blocks 13-10 in favor of Buffalo. And giveaways 10-4, New Jersey with 10. Omar made 41 saves for the win for a 9.76 save percentage for Buffalo. And Mackenzie Blackwood gets in his name back up there again. 33 saves, 917 save percentage for loss today. Alright, on to Pittsburgh versus Washington. Pittsburgh won this one 3-2 in overtime. Washington just cannot catch a break lately, it seems like. But then again, that's how Pittsburgh was there for a while before their current winning streak. So, it is what it is. First period, 6.41 in, and Kenny Malkin scores his fourth on the power play from Chris Letang and Jake Gensel. Then at 4.32 of the second, Richard Ponick scores his second from Zidane Chara and John Carlson. Then at 13.18, Carr Sheary scores his fifth from Evgeny Kuznetsov to make it 2-1 Washington. 22 seconds later, Jake Gensel scores his sixth from John Marino and Kasperi Kapanen to tie the game. Then they go to overtime, hitting 43 in overtime. Kasperi Kapanen's third of the year from Teddy Bluger and Christian Jerry. Goalie point and in overtime. All right, so Kasperi Kapanen had goal and an assist in this game. And Jake Gensel had a goal and assist. So those, I believe, are the only multi-point guys. Yep. Alright, Pittsburgh outshot Washington 37, I'm sorry, 37 22. Pittsburgh won the faceoff battle 56 44. Pittsburgh was 1 for 2 in the power play, Washington 0 for 2. Four play minutes each. 31 hits for Washington to Pittsburgh's 15. 16 13, Washington won the block category. And giveaways were 9 to 4, Washington with 9. Goldies, Tristan Jerry, 20 saves for the win, 909 save percentage, and Vitek Vanacek had 34 saves, 919 save percentage for the loss for Washington. On to Chicago versus Columbus. Chicago with another win, another overtime win too. Well, technically it was a shootout overtime win, but still, it's a win. This one started 8-11 into the first. Carl Soderberg scores his third on the power play from Patrick Kane and Alex DeBrinkett. 
10.03 in the first, Patrick Kane's ninth, from Pius Suter and Matias Yanmark make it 2 0. Then Columbus responds at 11.44 of the third, Cam Atkinson's eighth from Boone Jenner. 48 seconds into the second, the Columbus ties the game at that point, 2 2. 48 seconds into the second period, Patrick Liney's seventh on the power play from Seth Jones and Jack Ross. Oh, I can't speak, I'm sorry. Jack Roslevic. Then at 8-12 of the second, Brandon Hagel of Chicago scores his first of the year from Patrick Kane and Carl Soderberg, making a 3-2 at that point. 9-24 into the second. Patrick Lainey's eighth on the power play from Cam Atkinson and Seth Jones, tying it at three. 15-05 of the second. Dominic Kubala scores his sixth from Duncan Keith and Carl Soderberg, making it 4-3 Chicago. 3.37 into the third, Adam Boquist scores his first of the year on the power play from Patrick Kane and Dominic Kubalik. 10 minutes into the third, Oliver Bjorkstrand's fifth on the power play from Jack Roslevic and Gabriel Carlson making it 5-4 five, yeah, five, at that point. Then at 16 minutes into the third, Columbus ties at 5-5, five, five. Oliver Bjorkstrand's sixth from Patrick Line. This one would go to shootout. Alex DeBrinkett would score the winning goal in shootout for Chicago, giving them the two points. Columbus won. A lot of scoring in this game. This was not a goalie's game. Let's see. Carl Soderberg had a goal and two assists. Definitely his best game of the year. Considering he now has seven points on the season. That is uh, three of his seven points right there. Patrick Kane had one goal and three assists, so good game for Patrick Kane, but that's not surprising either. I put him at the 30 point mark too. Let's see, Alex DeBrinkett had a couple points. Yeah, he only had one. Oh, he had one point in the shootout winning goal, sorry. And Dominic Kabalik had a goal and assist. On the Columbus side, Patrick Laine, two goals, both power plays. Roslovic, two go- two assists, sorry. Yorkshire, two goals, I'm sorry, Laine, two goals and an assist, sorry. And Seth Jones had two assists? Yeah, two assists. So there you have it. Cam Atkinson, a goal and assist, sorry. Alright, Chicago outshot Columbus 34-30. Faceoffs were in favor of Chicago 54-46. Power play 2 for 4 for Chicago, 3 for 4 for Columbus. Not a good penalty killing night for either team. 10 penalty minutes each. Hits were 14 13 in favor of Chicago. Blocks 17 9 in favor of Columbus. And giveaways 15 12. Columbus with 15. That's a lot of giveaways <laughs> for both teams. Not surprising, it was 6 5 the score. Lincoln in for Chicago, 25 saves, 833 save percentage for the win. And Corpusello, 29 saves, 853 save percentage for the loss. I could only imagine what it'd be like to be a fly in that locker room. Post game for the Columbus Blue Jackets to hear what Tortorella would be saying about that defensive play. Whew, I can only imagine the curse words flowing out of his mouth right now at them. Alright, on to Montreal versus Ottawa, North Division matchup here. Ottawa gets the win again, 5-4 in shootout. Montreal seems to be having issues. They were looking dang good to begin the year. The last week or so, they had just... Not looked like they did before, let's just say that. Alright, so Ottawa started scoring a minute 36 into the first. Drake Batherson's fifth from Derek Stepan and Artem Zub. Zub? Zub? Zub, I think is how they say it. 957 into the first. Brady Kachuk's seventh on the power play from Drake Batherson and Tim Stutzla. Stutzla, sorry. With that assist, Stutzla now has more assists on the season than uh, the guy that, that they drafted, or that they traded for that draft pick. Eric Carlson has four assists on the year. Stutzla's five now. 
not compare him because if you really did and then combined all the players that they got for him and the ones they've lost, definitely outscoring what Eric Carlson has done this year. That trade has not aged well. Now, if at some point in the next, what was it, eight-year deal he signed with San Jose? If at some point in the next seven seasons, because I doubt it's this year, they win a Stanley Cup, it would make it kind of more worth it, no matter what. Now, if Ottawa wins multiples in that time, with a lot of the guys like Norris, Tierney, and Stutzla being front and center in that, then they win the trade. <laughs> That's just how it's going to work, because Norris has looked good this year, Stutzla has looked good, Tierney's had an alright season. I mean, he's not an offensive dynamo by any stretch, but he's a solid two-way player. So, this point is not looking like a win for San Jose. Not at all. All right, moving on. Sorry, I got off on that one, but Brady Kachuk, 7th on the power play, 957 on the uh, the first, making 2-0 at that point. Shea Weber's third at 1603 of the first from Jake Evans and Corey Perry. Always interesting to see Perry's name pop up. Make it 2-1 end of the first. Second period, 341 in. Eric Brandstrom's first on the power play from Colin White and Connor Brown. Making it 3-1 Ottawa at that point. But here comes Montreal. 452 into his second. Jonathan Drouin second unassisted. It's kind of surprising Drouin only has two goals. Kind of expect more than that from him in the goal scoring area. 10.06 in the second. Shea Weber's fourth from Phil Deneau and Brett Kulak making a 3-3 tie end of the second period. 8.06 in the third. Tyler Toffoli's 12th from Phil Deneau and Joel Edmondson. 10.11 into the third. Freddie Kachuk ties it again at four. His eighth of the year from Josh Norris and Thomas Chabot. Or Thomas Chabot. Oh, I forgot to mention... 1356 of the first Brady Kachuk fought Ben Sherratt. It was interesting to see a Kachuk brother fight. Uh, Tim Stusa scores the shootout winning goal for Ottawa. So, good on him. Another great game for him. Looking like he's going to be a dang solid player. Already a top scoring player from his draft class. But not many of them are playing, so... Just saying. Definitely looking better than Lafreniere year of the Rangers, that's for sure. But it's early. I guess those next Sidney Crosby things weren't, aren't working out thus far for Lafreniere, year, but he's only 18. So give him another couple years before we can start saying bust. But at this point, Ranger fans have to be worried. And honestly, with everything that's going on with the Rangers, there's a lot to be worried about right now. I'll talk about that at the end of the video. Ottawa outshot Montreal 39-36. Montreal won the faceoff dot 51-49. Montreal 0 for 3 on the power play. And Ottawa 2 for 4. Good power play game for the uh, Senators there. Pelham has 13-11. Montreal with 13. It's 34-30. Montreal with 34. 14 blocks each, giveaway 6-5, Montreal with 6, carry price 35 saves, 897 save percentage for the loss, and Matt Murray 32 saves, 889 save percentage for the win. Alright, Nashville vs Detroit. This is the battle of the two bottom teams in the Central Division. <laughs> and Nashville won that battle. 2-0. No scoring in the first or second period. 436 into the third. Philip Forsberg's ninth of the year on the power play from Roman Yossi and Michael Granlund. Then 957 of the third. They added their, their I wouldn't say guaranteed goal because two old leads aren't that important. As my duck showed yesterday. They showed three goals mean nothing. Ely Tol uh, Tolvanen scores his second on the power play for Philip Forsberg and Roman Yossi. Uh, Nashville outshot Detroit 33-24. Nashville won the faceoff dot 54-46. Nashville 
Nashville 2 for 4 on the power play. Detroit 0 for 1. Final minutes were 8 2. Detroit with 8. Hits 33 16. Nashville 33. Both teams at 15 blocks. Detroit 11 giveaways to Nashville 5. Pekka Rene scores. Or not scores, I'm sorry. Saved 24 shots against for 1,000 save percentage for the shutout. Jonathan Bernier, 31 saves, 939 save percentage. Great game in the loss for Bernier. You know, he still allowed two goals, but still a good game for him. Edmonton versus Vancouver. This is the last game of the day. Edmonton scores four, uh, wins this game 4-3. Uh, 106 into the first, Vancouver scores first. Bo Horvat's ninth for Nate Schmidt and it. Elias Parson, 806 into the first. Tyler Myers, third, unassisted. 1517 into the first. Elias Parson's eighth for JT Miller and Jordy Ben. Making 3 0 in the first. Looks like Vancouver's going to run away with this game. Not so fast. 1843 into the first. Dominic Cahoon's third from Tyson Berry and Leon Dressidel. Making it 3 1. Now it would stay 3 1 until the third period. No scoring in the second. 55 seconds into the third. Dominic Cahoon's second of the game, fourth of the year, from Leon Dreisail and Kyler Yamamoto. Then at 423 of the third, Connor McDavid's 13th of the year on the power play ties the game from Leon Dreisail and Alex Chason. This point. I'm not surprised that Vancouver fans feel like how I did yesterday. Again, really? Why do we have to suck like this? This is sad. 13-25 into the third. Tyler Enos' second goal of the year from Drew Jarkaria and Adam Larson. That would be your winning goal. I know your pain right now, Vancouver fans. I do. Shots on goal. Vancouver won the shots on goal category 33-29. They also won the faceoff dot 58-42. Edmonton 1 for 4 on the power play. Vancouver 0 for 2. 20 minutes 8 for Vancouver, 4 for Edmonton. Hits were 29-19 in favor of Edmonton. Blocks 18-15 in favor of Edmonton. Giveaways 9-3. Vancouver with 9. Mike Smith, 30 saves for the win, 909 save percentage, and Thatcher Demko, 25 saves, 862 save percentage. There you have it, that's all the games for today. Alright, as I mentioned before, I wanted to touch on the New York Rangers situation for a minute. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard about what has happened with Artemi Panarin taking his leave of absence. He is currently fearful for his family's life in Russia. He's been a very outspoken critic of the president of... Wait, is he president or is he... Yeah, president, I believe it is. Of Russia, Vladimir Putin. He's been very critical of him. And he has been a supporter of the lead opposition uh, politician who was poisoned they believe by the well not directly by Putin but by Putin's people the FSB as they're called basically the New Age KGB um, and he came back and they threw him in jail he came back from England where he was poisoned to Russia and he's thrown in jail now Panarin for the last year or so has been posting stuff on social media and interviews very critical of him now, he still has family back in Russia, and they have been bearing the brunt of it from what I've understood from everything I've read about this subject. And at this point, he has been accused by his former coach, Andrei Nazarov, of paying off police to get away with beating an 18-year-old Latvian girl. Now, we have not heard this accusation from the girl. Uh, the team, the New York Rangers and the NHL support Artemi Panarin and believe him when he says that this is a false accusation. Nothing more than a way to get back at him for being outspoken against Vladimir Putin. I can't say one way or the other. Now, the optics of this is bad one way or the other. 
there's no good optics in this situation. Now, the NHL can support the player, and if more details come out, if there's an actual accuser, not a former coach saying this, and if this is actually able to be proven, what happens to Panarin then? Or, the alternative is, this is a massive conspiracy by Vladimir Putin and his followers in Russia. If that's the case, then where does the NHL go from there? Because there are quite a few Russian players that are very outspoken pro-Putin people, and that includes Alex Ovechkin. Now, I don't think it'll come down to actual issues on the ice involving this situation, but what is going to happen with this? This is kind of a unknown territory. I mean, we, we had the Iron Curtain back in the, oh, ever since basically the Soviet Union was created. So there was no Russians really, or many of the Eastern European countries where there were many good hockey players back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They didn't start coming over until the mid to late 80s. And by then, most of them were actually fairly older, but still were very good players when they came over. Look at Igor Larionov, Sergei Makarov. Uh, Sergei Fedorov was younger, but still he played on the Russian Red Army for some time. Uh, Vladislav Fetisov and... Uh, uh, Constantino. I can't remember his first name. But yeah, I mean, all, almost all of them played for Detroit at the time, and everybody was like, oh, Detroit's never going to win while he's rushing, and they did. But that's the closest we've had to a situation like this. But none of those guys, like, none of the Stastny brothers had these sort of accusations thrown out against them. They were just called traitors. Okay, whatever. <laughs> it is what it is communist countries fighting to to hurt people that left them. Alright, fine, whatever. Nobody's gonna believe it. Now, nobody I think believes anything that the Russian state says right now. Internationally, at least. But if something like this comes to light that is actually true, that he did pay out the police to get away with beating an 18-year-old girl, and the league and the team has backed him, that puts them in a bad place at that point. So, honestly, from everything that I've read, it does not sound like this is accurate at all. So, now the league has to deal with, what do they do about Russia doing this? Are they going to do this about any and all players now that don't follow Putin, who are Russian descent? What do they do about this situation? Because this could get worse and worse and worse. Because now you go into the territory of they're trying to silence people that are in countries where freedom of speech is extremely important. So if they silence, succeed silencing him, what comes from that? What damage does this do when it comes to other international players if those countries start having issues like this? What is the protocol now? Well, right now, Artemi Panarin is taking a leave of absence. He's supposedly going to be taking care of his family, trying to get them out of Russia at this point. Now, for him, it'd be kind of stupid to go to Russia itself, because it sounds more like he might get arrested when he goes back. Now, is, they, is he going to go back, or is he going to go to one of the neighboring countries that are not going to arrest him and send him back there, but help him get his family to them? What is going to happen now? This is a very uncharted territory situation right now. So, keep an eye on everything. I mean, there's only so much anybody can do in life. I mean, at this point, he has to help his family. Understandable. But at the same time, hopefully the league and the team did not back themselves into a bad spot by supporting him outright without having more details hopefully it isn't something where where this is all being fabricated against him because that is probably worst case scenario as much as I hate to say because him being an 18 year old girl is a pretty bad situation if it's real I mean that doesn't sound good I mean 
Shocker, Russian police took money to let somebody famous get away with something. That's not surprising at all, if that were the case. Because, let's face it, anybody who knows anything knows Russian police are not the most uncorrupt people in the world. They are fairly corrupt. That's just how it is. <laughs> I mean, we don't have any say in how they run their country. They run their country their way. And if that's how they run it, that's how they run it. Like, you can't change that from here. So, if you want to know more about this, go look up what you can. I mean, I, I'm going off of the details that I've read and off of knowing what anybody knows, anybody out there knows what Putin and he, what he does running his country. Now... Hopefully Panarin is safe. Hopefully his family is safe. But at the same time, probably need to find out more details if this is true or not. Hopefully it's not. Hopefully it is just the Russian state trying to belittle an opponent. Because you know what? At least he could come over here and get citizenship here or in Canada. Here in the U.S. or Canada. Or I guess he can have dual citizenship nowadays, but I don't think he could because he's not from either one. I'm not sure how that actually works with dual citizenship. If you know, write in the comments. But that's all I'm going to say on it. I mean, the, I know this is getting a little bit on the political side. I'm sorry about that. I'm not trying to. But that is the situation. And some things in life you cannot avoid politics as annoying and evil as they are at their root cause. In my personal opinion, politics are nothing but evil. So, I'm sorry to bring them in here, but I'm just trying to explain the situation as best as I can. So, best of luck to our time, Panarin. I really hope these accusations are not true, because if they are, what are the repercussions for that too? Because, former King Defender, um, oh, what was his name? Russian Defender... Won two Stanley Cups with them, too. But he was arrested for... What was it? Assaulting his wife? And he ended up getting banned from the league, so... Hopefully the league and the team, the Rangers, did not put themselves in a bad spot with this. Really hope not, because that could be really bad if they did. And hopefully, like I said, it is just Russia being Russia. And hopefully his family is safe. Alright, that's all I'm going to say on that. Let me know what you think in the comments is going to happen with all this because who the heck knows what's going to happen at this point. Alright, other than that, thank you all for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you all next video. Bye everybody.